as we've been talking about for the last several weeks, you've been praying about and giving towards this uh, Moldova mission trip. And we left on the 5th of November. We came back on this past Monday, the 12th. You can see we brought a little souvenir with us, the Moldovan crud. And so, um, and we, and we, were, we, we had planned new testimonies today. We are going to do one this service. We planned to have two. Um, Sam Owens is going to bring a testimony this morning as well, but he texted me yesterday. He's got the crud, so he, well, we'll just be hearing from one testimony today. But we wanted, to, we wanted you to hear the stories. It's one thing to see the pictures. It's one thing to read about what happens on a mission trip. But there's something powerful that happens to folks that go. I mean, we think about what we're going to do and the work that we're going to accomplish while we're there and, and how God may use us. But there is an impact on the team members and, and things that God reveals to them and things that he shows them and things he does in their lives that you can only experience by hearing from, from them, how God impacted them and how he spoke to them during the trip. So Kayla Schuler, I'm going to ask Kayla to come up and share a testimony of just how God spoke. And, and when I ask them to share testimonies, I ask them to sort of, uh, sort of organize them around four questions, four things for them to think about. She may, come on up, she may use them in a scripted way, she may not. Um, but the questions were this, tell, tell us about something that had a significant impact on you, some way God spoke that you weren't expecting. Describe an experience where you saw the Spirit of God at work, and of course you could probably give dozens of them, but tr describe one experience you saw the Spirit of God at work. Um, tell us about one thing that God taught you about himself while you were there, and then tell us about one thing that God taught you about yourself that needs to change as a result of that trip. So Kayla, share with us some of the things that God spoke to you, how he revealed himself to you during this trip, and some of the experiences that you had. I'll okay. give you a microphone so you can.
Sunday more, um, to sit on my table, and I, I see in Moldova, the simplest things for them are, are their greatest gift. Just that one meal that after church provides for, for, the, for the people in the village, and some people in the village come to this church to eat with them. And they are all so thankful. Um, and I see them praying before each, before each person eats, they pray their thanks. And I forget to do that sometimes. And before, I'm just starving it down because I'm hungry, especially on Sunday. I'm kidding. I'm not hungry. <laughs> um, so it, it's just the littlest things where I'm like, oh, God, you know, and that is just so, that is just so simple, um, the blessings that we have every morning and every day that we can be sharing with the Lord. Um, and to speak on simple things, the fellowship there between the youth is incredible. All they have is each other, these youth, um, this youth ministry. And some of them don't even attend the church or initially don't even attend the church. But the church hosts sports events, um, activities. Each child knows how to play at least two instruments, the accordion or the violin. Um, so the youth is actively involved. I've never seen a guy, a group of men, youth men, playing in a way we do in this ministry. They do it with so much joy. And they love it. I mean, they're up there as proud as can be. I can't even imagine a 10-year-old here, let alone <laughs> like a young boy. So I think that that's pretty awesome, that the way the youth, it's just those little <coughs> things, you know, handing somebody an instrument. Hey, how about some play on our instrument? Um, they just absolutely do that. So that's definitely something that God taught me about himself, that it, it's just really easy to love him and to be thankful for him and to just take the time to, hey, man, missionaries to Moldova have come back with. And I encourage you to ask all the people who went about their experiences. But for me, if I were to sum up what I've learned, like what has changed me, it's this verse kind of sums it up. <clears throat> Take heed that you do not be charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do charitable deeds, do not sound a trumpet before you Surely I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees sees in secret will himself reward you. So it's very easy when we go on this to say, oh, but then when you go anywhere, to be excited and proud, and you want to post pictures, and you want to sound like, share what we did there, but for personally for me, I always need to check, what are my intentions? Why am I sharing this photo? Am I trying to be boastful about the things that I think I did there, or am I trying to glorify God? Is this picture going to be a, a speak for, for him? Is there a purpose that I'm going to share this with who is going to be um, honored? And um, it got kind of got me thinking about, you know, when you come back and you're like trying to get settled into your everyday life. Okay, but how do I want to be settled in? I want to have that same heart that I did in Moldova. Because there's so many people here who have needs. 
maybe it's not firewood and maybe it's not, you know, food, but it's maybe they're struggling with somebody who's passed away, you know, struggling emotionally, struggling physically. And every day I feel like there's somebody, whether they're in the church or not, who you can be a missionary to. And you can reach out and be like, hey, um, you know, I'm having this time. You know, let me come over. Let's chat. Or is there anything I need? And I always ask that. I mean, I never really like asking that because you need people coming out. So I usually just, I, I've kind of set a goal for myself to try to every day look and see where I can be a little bit of a missionary. Even if it's for somebody who maybe is struggling with a child at the store and I just drop things on the ground and say, like, have a care. Can you see that? For you to pick them up. That is something so, so good and joyful for that person who maybe is having a hard time. So for me, that's what's changed for me. I want to try to be more, more of an everyday missionary and not just a once a week missionary. Because I think that's important, and realistically, that's what God God wants us to do. Thank you, Kayla, for sharing. And and we had just an incredible team that went this year. Uh, This this year was a little bit different than previous years. We teamed with another uh, International Baptist Church church, the, the Rome Baptist Church down in Rome, uh, we had eight people from our church went, five from their church went. Um, and, I, and I just have to tell you, the spirit among this team was absolutely amazing. Um, we, we were all there focused on one thing, and that is that we were there to be the hands and feet of Christ. Um, and we weren't there on mission from Aviano Baptist Church and on mission from Rome Baptist Church. We were there on mission from God to do what he brought us there to do, to, to allow him to use us in any way that he saw fit. And I want to thank the team members. If you're here this morning and are part of that team, I want to thank you for being willing to step out of your comfort zone and go. Uh, Kayla said this is her third year to go. We had some folks who went this year. This is their first time on a mission trip. And if you've ever done that, you know what a scary thing that is, to step out of your comfort zone and say, I'm going to go do mission work somewhere, and I don't really know what God's going to do when we get there. And so just a huge thank you for the team and, and especially for the testimonies. Because I think it's one thing to see pictures, and it's one thing to read a write-up, but it's absolutely something different to hear the stories and to hear how, how God was at work and the things he's done in and through us during that time. And you can only get a sense of those things by hearing the testimonies and hearing the stories. And as Kayla ended her testimony, as kind of a great lead into the message. Thank you, by the way, for the good setup. We are all on mission with God at all times. And so I I don't want us to get the idea. We talk about missions and the work that God did on this mission trip this past week. And then next week, we just go about our lives like nothing ever happened. But to be challenged, that's what I want to do this morning is a challenge. I'm going to answer those same four questions. And I want to to build my answers around one passage of Scripture, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. So if you've got a Bible, turn there with me. Because I believe that God is able to speak through this mission trip in, in more than just a way of what he did in that snapshot in time in Moldova, but to challenge our hearts that we are on mission with him. We don't have to go to the far corners of the earth to be on mission with him. God brought you to Italy for a reason, to be on mission with him. God's got you in the shop that you're in to be on mission with him. Or if you're in school, in that particular classroom, to be on mission with him. And I want to challenge our hearts this morning with that thought of how can God use me as a missionary wherever he has happened to put me. Let me read Acts 1.8. You, you are probably very familiar with the passage, but let me read it just the same. This is Jesus speaking. And he said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. I want to answer those same four questions that I asked the, those giving the testimony to answer. And the first question was this. Tell us something that was just had a significant impact on you while you were there. The, sun, the last Sunday, Sunday morning we were there, I got to preach in one of the churches. We got to preach in various churches throughout the villages. We did firewood delivery almost every day in the morning, and we visited homes, evangelistic visits while we were there. Um, we had a youth service one night. We had children's ministry almost every day. Um, and then almost every evening, we got to preach in a different church. We, there, were, there were four preachers on the team, so we got to preach in different churches during the time 
that we were there. Sunday morning, I was in the church in the city of Kahul, which is the biggest city uh, in, that, in that district. And I shared this thought in that service. Because as we sat there in that service, the Lord just really kind of impacted me with something. And that was, a, here are these people in the poorest country in Europe. And, and we are separated by so many things. By nationality and language and culture and upbringing and social status, economic status. I mean, you could just name the ways that there's so many separations between us and them. But we sat there in that service that Sunday morning, and they sang the same songs that we sing. And they do the same things in service. They had a, same, they had a prayer time during the service. They pray the same way that we pray. And they pass the offering plates exactly the same way that we do. And they open up the Word of God, and they, and they spend time studying the Word of God the exact same that we do. And the Lord really just impressed me in that moment that all of those differences, when we came together that Sunday morning, that none of those differences mattered. As brothers and sisters in Christ, that was the thing that connected us all. We were separated by so many things, but we were connected by that. The fact that we are all part of the family of God, all part of the, the body of Christ. And the sermon I preached there that Sunday morning, I could have preached anywhere. I could have preached here, and it would have been just as fitting. The sermon that the pastor preached after me, that's right, two sermons that Sunday morning. You're welcome, by the way, Kayla, that we don't have two on Sunday morning. But the sermon that he preached right after me, he could have preached here with a translator, and it would have spoken to this congregation every bit as much and been absolutely as applicable here as it was there. And it just reminded me that the, that the Word of God is just as relevant now, just as applicable now as it was 2,000 years ago when Jesus spoke those words in Acts chapter 1. The applicability, the relevancy of the Word of God hasn't changed, and it's just as applicable to, to them in this poor, remote, almost forgotten part of the world in Moldova as it is to us, a group of fairly well-off, mostly Americans living here in Italy. And then no matter what changes, time and cultures and, and the different technologies and all of that, no matter what changes throughout time, this one thing remains true, the Word of God stands forever. And as we sat in that service, the Lord just reminded, had a significant impact on me as we sat there in that service that morning. The second question was, describe an experience where you saw the Spirit of God at work. And, and I could go on. We, we all could. We could go on for hours about different experiences where, where we saw the Spirit of God at work there, but I asked to narrow it down to one. So we just tell about one thing that stuck out where we really saw the hand of God at work. These words in Acts chapter 1, these are the last recorded words of Jesus before he ascends back into heaven. And you know, last words are important. The last words you'll ever speak to a friend before they PCS out, that's important. You, you save the most important thing you've got to say till the last. Or the last words you'll ever speak to someone. We, we don't waste time with those words, right? We don't beat around the bush. We don't mince words when it comes to the last thing we're going to say to someone. That's the most important thing. Of all the things I've ever said to you and of all the interactions we've ever had, let me sum it up right here in this one little nugget that I want you to take with you. And these are the last words of Jesus. Three years he's poured himself into his disciples. Three years he's ministered to them and discipled them and grown them and equipped them. And this is the one thing I want you to remember. And what does he say? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And there's a reminder there that, that the Lord impacted me as I saw His Spirit at work, that He goes ahead of us to do the work that He's called us to do. He's preparing the battlefield, so to speak, before we, we head out, before we take the field. He's already gone out there. And He's given us the power. The power that we go with is not our own. It's not our strength. It's not our smarts. It's not our wits. It's not us. Kayla said that was one of the things that impacted her. This is not me at work. I'm a tool in the master's hand, and the power comes from him. One of our home visits was to the mother and father-in-law of a lady named Olympia. Now, Olympia is the Emily Johnson of their church. She's their children's ministry coordinator. 
And she is involved in everything children in the Crihana Vecchia Church. In fact, she's like the Pied Piper. Everywhere she goes, there's this little trail of kids that follows her around. Everything that happens with children's ministry, Olympia is involved in it. We visited her mother and father-in-law. On the way over to the visit, as we've done on every home visit, we asked, what do we know about this family that we're going to go spend some time with? And Olympia was with us, and so she was telling us about her mother and father-in-law. She said her father-in-law, Pietro, is an alcoholic. And so it's a pretty common problem all over the world, especially there. There's no jobs, there's no future, there's no hope, and a lot of people have just sort of given up on life and they've turned to the bottle. Her father, Pietro, is an alcoholic, and she said if he's home, he's probably going to be drunk. I thought, well, great, that'll make for an exciting visit. Her mother-in-law, she said, Maria, she's a staunch atheist. And Olympia said, we've shared the gospel, me and my husband have shared the gospel with him, with him dozens of times, they just don't want to hear it. So we're on our way over there, it was, it was myself and Dave Hodgson, he's the pastor of the Rome Baptist Church, and his wife Kathy, the three of us were on this visit. Now before we knew any of this, who we were going to go visit, I had asked Dave, I said, hey Dave, do you want to take the lead on this visit? And then we heard about who we were going to visit, heard what the situation was, I reached over to Dave and I patted him on the leg and I said, no pressure brother. I was a little bit relieved, I got to say, the, the fleshly side of me, a little bit relieved I had asked him to take the lead on this visit. I wanted an easy visit, a whole warm, fuzzy visit, and I want this, this challenge of dealing with an alcoholic and a staunch atheist. So we got in the home, Kayla talked about their hospitality. We got in the home and they brought out, if you saw some, they're out on the, the welcome center table out there, these little, like, look like half donut holes. They brought a bunch of those out and some tea and they just were just showering us with hospitality. But the moment came when we, it was time to tell them why we were there. And, and as soon as that happened, you know, this conversation started to die down. I looked over at Dave, who was supposed to be taking the lead on this visit, just as he stuffed one of those donuts into his mouth. And I thought, hmm, no pressure, huh? When we went on these visits, we, we took these with us. We took the, I don't know if you've ever seen these, these wordless book bracelets. And the color of those beads all represent an aspect of the gospel story. It's an easy way to, to share the gospel. We took these bracelets with us, and we took these little cards that had an explanation, a scripture reference that explained all of the colors on the bracelet. It just walks it down the Romans road. And I, as, I was, as I was putting the message together, I, I, was, I realized that there was a lot of people that don't know what I'm talking about when I talk about the Romans road. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of that, the Romans road. Okay, about a third of you have heard of that. The Romans Road is simply this, four or five scriptures from the book of Romans. And with those four or five scriptures, you can share the entire gospel message. And so when you go to, sh go to share your faith with somebody, say, I don't know where to start, I don't know how to do that, I've never done that before, the Romans Road is an easy way to, to walk through that. It starts with Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, and it, it lays out in a very clear way, the Bible teaches we're not inherently good, all of us are sinners. And we get to the point of the first half of Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. That's that black bead. The, the, that our sin has separated us from God. Romans 5.8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The shed blood, that's the red bead, the shed blood on the cross of Christ for our sins, to pay our wages of sin, which is death. And then Romans 8.1, you can write these down if you want. I can give them to you later again if you want to you get them. You can write down the Romans road. In Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So if we repent of our sins and trust in him, we are washed white as snow. That's what the white bead means. And that the promise then is that we can spend eternity in heaven with him, the last part of Romans 6, 23. Though the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And the yellow bead represents the streets of gold. A very simple way to share the gospel, the Romans road. We had these bracelets, we had these little cards with the Romans road all translated into Romanian with us. And as I started to go through it and I shared the, the black bead that all of us have sinned and our sin separates us from God, Maria shook her head and she said, yes, that's right, we're all sinners. And I thought, well, I didn't expect that. I mean, usually an atheist, one of the first places they're going to attack the concept of sin, I don't believe that's even real. Here's an atheist telling me, yes, we're all sinners. I shared that first part of Romans 6.23, our sin separates us from God. And Pietro jumped in at that point. He said, yes, that's right. We can't go to heaven because of our sin. And Maria chimes into the conversation. She said, our sin keeps us from God. 
And I thought to myself, where are we? I mean, we were, we were coming over here and, and we're hearing about this man, Pietro, who had given up on life. And he's turned to the bottle for comfort. That's his only source of comfort that he sees in life. And Maria, who is this hardened atheist that heard the gospel over and over again, was completely shut down. I thought, whose home are we in right now? A few minutes later, God moved in a way I absolutely did not expect. As we, as we wrapped up, I brought them through the plan of salvation, and I asked them if they wanted to know that they would spend eternity in heaven when they, with God when they died. And they both willingly, almost eagerly, prayed to receive Christ. And I just absolutely was stunned. We got out in the van. Olympia was sitting in the front seat. She was speechless. We all were. We absolutely did not expect this, this man who, who had been drinking that morning. He wasn't drunk, but he certainly was a little happy. And his wife, who was a hardened atheist, we absolutely did not expect that visit to go like that. And Olympia said almost to herself, I think she was just sort of thinking out loud, she said, well, maybe it was the way you said it. I guarantee it was not. I didn't say anything to them that time that Olympia and her husband had not said a dozen times before. But Paul said this, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, he said, my message my preaching was not with wise and persuasive words. It wasn't a, a cute little bracelet and a little card with Bible verses on it. It wasn't wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. We left that home that day, and so we just saw the Spirit of God at work in a way that we absolutely could not have imagined and could not have predicted. It was the Spirit of God moving ahead of us, preparing the battlefield, convicting hearts, and bringing them, revealing to them their need for repentance. The second question that I asked the folks giving testimonies was, what did God teach you about himself? And it wasn't really something that he taught me about himself, but something he reminded me of about himself. And that is just how big our God is but just how small we often make him out to be. He said, you will be my witnesses. And then he said, you will be my witnesses, but he carries that out to the ends of the earth. And witnessing's easy. That's the easy part. You can use this little bracelet, you can use this little card, write down the Romans road. Being a witness is the easy part. You just tell what you know. Right? You, they call a witness to the stand in the courtroom. And their job's not to convince the jury. Their job's not to come up with some great story. They just tell what they know. That's what witnesses do. Witnessing's the easy part. To the ends of the earth? Now, that's the hard part. That's a God-sized task, something that only the Spirit of God can do. Just how big our God is to take our little story, to take our little witness and to carry it to the ends of the earth. Now, that's a big God that can do that. We visited another home, another man named Pietro. It's, it's a common name, Peter is the translation. We visited another home, this man named Pietro. And his wife had died some years before, and if they had children, their children, like most young people in Moldova, had left the country. They weren't coming back. There's no future for them there. And so their kids didn't come visit. And, and P Pietro hadn't been visited in months, best we can tell. No one had come by. He was a little chatty. Pietro just longed for human contact, anyone to come that, that he could talk to, he could tell his story to and interact with. As we delivered, after we delivered the firewood, Elliot Burkott was taking the lead on that visit. He started sharing the gospel message. message. And, and every time Elliot took a breath, Pietro launched into a story. Another story about what had happened in his life and what work he did and this place the, he served in in the, in the Soviet army back in the day. He had a thousand stories and he just longed to tell them with anybody. Every time he got a chance, he'd jump into a story. And Elliot did a great job. He would listen a few minutes very graciously and then bring him back to the gospel and bring him back to the truth and the reason why we were there. And there was a point in time in that visit that Pietro's demeanor changed. And the, the look on his face had hardened. And he, and he told us about how he had been raised in school in, in Marxist teachings, Leninist 
teachings. And he said, during the Soviet Union, this is what they taught us, that man is the ultimate authority. We will decide, we and we alone will decide what is right and wrong. The government's the only savior that we need. That's what we have been brought up. We share with them, those are lies. You look, you know, look around you, Pietro. Look at the village you're in. Look at the, the sad conditions. This is the, the sin of man in this world. This is the result of that. Only God can save us from the, the, the sin that is within us. The government cannot do that. Now, Pietro didn't trust Christ during that visit, but he did promise he'd read these Bible verses that, that we gave to him. And we got back in the van, and we, started, we had a conversation. I think the comment was made, well, well that wasn't a successful visit because Pietro didn't trust in Christ. And we had the opportunity to talk about what success in witnessing looks like. That, listen, God went ahead of us and he connected these dots where this group of Americans who live in Italy, God brought us here to Italy so that we could get involved in this trip to Moldova in November of 2018 so that we could visit an extremely lonely old man in this obscure, forgotten part of an Eastern European country that most people don't even know exists. Now, we could not have thought of that. We could not have put that together. That's evidence of the hand of God, how big our God is to put those dots all together. And we, we went and we shared the truth. We witnessed that success to do what it is that God's called us to do. And we will trust him to do the rest. If he can carry our, our witness, our meager witness to the ends of the earth, certainly he can carry it into Pietro's home. Certainly he can carry it into his home. Third question was, what is one thing God revealed to you about yourself? This is the last question that needs to change. One last visit I need to tell you about, visit with a lady named Vasilisa. This was the most emotional visit that I was on. I think the most emotional visit everybody was part of that group was on while we were there. Vasilisa, as we talked with her, she's a 56-year-old woman, and she looks like she's 86. Very difficult life, just, I mean, hard living conditions, but she told us about, about, about abuse that she suffered, the hands of her, her deceased husband, the hands of even neighbors as she was growing up. She just tried to live right and do right and be nice to her neighbors, and for some reason they mistook that as weakness, and some reason they felt compelled to abuse her physically for that. This horrible, horrible life that she lived. And as we shared about sin and shared about our, our need for salvation, Vasilisa sat there with a, a handkerchief in her hand and she sobbed into it the entire time we were there. And she said this, she said, I've sinned so much, God can't possibly want me. And I thought to myself, here is this woman who had gone through so much so much abuse at the hands of other people, she could be pointing the finger. Do you know what they did to me? Do you know how horrible this world has been to me? And yet she realized the depth of her own sin. And she said, I've sinned so much, God can't possibly want me. We shared that when Christ died for sins, he died for all of them. He said, it is finished from the cross. He meant he paid for them all. That anyone who trusts in Christ will be saved. And we asked her, she wanted to know she's, she could spend eternity in heaven with God. And as she attempted to, to pray a, a prayer of salvation, she just sobbed into this handkerchief the entire time. God really revealed something about my own life as, I, as we left that visit. And that was how broken Vasilisa was over her own sin. In, in comparison, certainly the sins that she had committed in her life paled in comparison to the ones that were committed against her. But just how absolutely broken she was over the sin in her life. She didn't try to deny the reality of it. She didn't try to sugarcoat any of it. Well, all, what I did was justified. People were mean to me, and so I responded back. She didn't try to do any of that. She was absolutely impacted by the reality of the sin in her life. The cost of it, not only in her own life, but the relationships that she had with other people, the impact that her sin had on herself and on others around her. 
And I couldn't help but to realize as, as, we, as that, that visit replays in my mind her brokenness over her sin and how much I need more of that in my life. My life's not riddled with sin, but when it happens, how callous I am, how almost insignificant I treat it, but how broken she was over her sin. It was something that, that the Lord... It's seared into my head. I can't get over that image. We could go on for hours talking about the experiences, what God did in that place, how he moved in the hearts of over 100 people came to know Christ during that visit. It wasn't because of us, because of him, his grace and him moving in that area. But let me just kind of wrap it up with this. If you are saved here this morning. If you're a child of God, have repented of your sins, you've trusted in Christ, and you're here this morning, realize this, that God hasn't just done that in your life so that you can go to heaven when you die. I mean, that's, that's a great benefit, right? Certainly, He wants us to spend eternity in heaven with Him, but that's not the only reason He's done that for you friend of mine used to say this all the time. He said, salvation's about you. It's just not all about you. If you're here this morning, you know Christ. He didn't just save you so that you can go to heaven when you die, but so that you can be on mission here while you're here. Don't think that the, it was just the military that brought you to Aviana or is going to take you to the next place that he's going to take you to. God had a hand in that, purposely brought you here, purposely put you in that work center you're in, purposely put you in that classroom that you're in so that you can be on mission with him. You don't have to go to Moldova, although I hope you do while you're, the course of time while you're here. We're going to go back again, and so I do hope that you join us on the next visit. But you don't have to go to a place like Moldova or to any of the far corners of the earth to be on mission with God. You're on mission with God right here, right now. Be my witnesses, he said. That's the easy part. Leave the hard stuff up to me, taking that message to the ends of the earth. Listen, we pray that our, our experiences have challenged you. So that we don't just leave today and we say, those were great stories. What a wonderful thing that happened there in Moldova as that team left. And we leave out of here and we forget completely about it absolutely unchanged. Our life goes on exactly the same as it was before. We pray that our, our experiences have challenged you to see yourself as on mission with God so that this afternoon or tomorrow as you encounter folks, you think about, I'm here on purpose, a divine appointment wherever God has put you. You'll see yourself as on mission with him and then follow him as he leads. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, what an amazing God you are. You saw us in our helpless state. Sinners who can do nothing about it. Separated from you. And for all of eternity, that's what we were facing. But in your love and in your grace and in your mercy, you sent your son to die for us. What an amazing thing you've done for us because of what an amazing God you are. But that's not it. You don't just save us for salvation's sake. You save us and you allow us to be a part of being on mission with you. Father, we know you don't need us make the rocks cry out, the dirt cry out. You don't need us, but you allow us to be a part of your mission. And Father, as we enter these moments of invitation, Lord, I pray if there's one here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, we shared with so many there in Moldova and brought them to that question, if you died right now, do you know you'd spend eternity in heaven with God? And maybe there's one here today that would say, no, I don't know that. I don't know for certain. Lord, that you would just impress upon their heart. Give them the boldness and the courage to just come down front and say, I need to know Jesus. 
for your children that are here. Maybe we've lost sight sometimes of the fact that we are on mission. 